is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon, always shooting it all. Stop, 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 stop. 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 I mean, you're way off, Skip. Hey, boy. Yeah, you know, it's not cynical, it's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and raw. Here is Steve Gruber. All right, my friends, welcome to it. Uh, so many things to keep up with, and I say to stand up America because it is time. It's uh, Tuesday here in the program. If you'd like to join the conversation, it's 888 This notion that America is aflame with racist tension and so forth, I, I think is nonsensical. And, and frankly, I don't buy it. But the, the president of the Missouri University System, Tim Wolf, forced into resignation yesterday over these growing cries and allegations of institutional racism and his failure to address demands of minority students on campus, specifically black students. One of his transgressions, one of the transgressions of the now former president, Tim Wolf, not doing more about a swastika smeared with human fecal matter on a bathroom wall just a few weeks ago. And I'm just wondering, as all of these students are gathered demanding his resignation, What exactly was the right course of action when one student, an unknown student, I might add, put his hands into poop, frankly, and smeared it into a swastika on one wall of one bathroom in one building on a massive campus? What what would you expect him to do? Should the president of the university race over with a bottle of Mr. Clean? Or is that promoting gender bias? I mean, this, this this idea of victimization, my God, it doesn't stop. So, all right, so you've got all these protests going on and this these allegations of, of institutional racism. So a reporter shows up, many of them did, but this one reporter, whatever, got himself noticed, um, and he was rejected by the crowd just trying to cover the story. Roll it. What is so hard about respecting our lips? Because I have a job to do. Yeah. We don't care about your job. I have a life to live. They have an education to get and a life to live. I'm a student. Please live. But sir, these are more students who are asking you. Don't listen to that. You need to calm down. Okay, but that's my job. And this is our friend. Our friend's life was on the line. We're asking you to respect that. And I'm trying to document that for history. Everybody else has died. They're being respectful. You got it. Everybody else is too, but they're being respectful. Please. They're being respectful about it. Everybody else is too, but they're being respectful. You're not. They just want to be together. That's simple. Okay. They are together. I'm not going to be together. No. No, you're not. You are the you're in soul on what they need right now, which is to be alone. Now I need you all you You lost this one, bro. You lost this one, bro. Back up. You lost this one, bro. You just lost this one, bro. You lost this one, bro. Back up. A reporter trying to do their job. Put the sign in his face. You lost this one, bro. Apparently, he lost this one, bro. Just back up. You lost this fight. Back up. I mean, this is this is the state. This is the state of a college education today. If you don't buy into the notion of white privilege, and that somehow anybody that is not white is a victim. And entitled to a whole litany of things, a whole menu of options that many need to be provided by the rest of us. And then there's something wrong with you. Okay, so the reporter was rejected there, and then a professor came over and, and spoke with the reporter for a moment. Let's hear that part. I made it. Can I talk to you? No, you need no. to get out. Well, you need to get out. No, I don't. You need to get out. I actually don't. All right. Hey, who wants to help me get this reporter out of here? I need some money. So then the professor, you know, teaching the high standards of respect for other people and and freedom of speech, the professor starts screaming, get the reporter out. And where was the reporter trying to be? What was the reporter so interested in to share the story? Well, he was going to a rally, you see, at the University of Missouri. There was a rally being held by some of these black students that are screaming racism, that they are victims. Now, keep in mind, 
These are all students at a, at a center for higher learning where they've earned scholarships or, or, or their parents have put down a lot of money. These are not, you know, these are not destitute people. These are people of some privilege, obviously. They're at the University of Missouri getting an education. I don't know what the education consists of, but they're there, right? And they were going, so he wanted, the reporter wanted to go to a rally before he was attacked by the crowd and attacked by the professor. What was the rally all about? Let's take a listen. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We must love and support each other. We have nothing. We have nothing to lose but our change. We have nothing to lose but our change. Our change. Power. 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 Our change. We have nothing to lose but our chains. You see, I was having this conversation, and Ivy and I have this conversation a lot, about race in America and the state of things. And I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't spend much time at all considering race or thinking about race or, you know, I certainly don't dwell on racist thoughts or conversations. A relative of mine attended the University of Missouri. I spoke to her yesterday. She says, I have no idea what they're talking about. She graduated there, I don't know, four or five years ago. She said "There's the, the, this whole notion that it's some sort of institutionalized racism is, is nonsense, she believes. Anyhow, there was another, here, here, we have another sample, another rally going on at the University of Missouri yesterday. Go with that one. Also, also... To the lady in the missus who thought it was okay to say the University of Missouri is making strides for change. Obviously not. Racism lives here and so do we. And if you're uncomfortable, I did my job. You're welcome. Tigers, how do we feel about that? I say power! I say power! I say power! I say power! Uh huh. There's a state of higher education today. If you're not white, you're a victim. If you're a conservative, you're an oppressor. A white liberal might get a pass, but probably not because you're still creating this victim in black and brown people, apparently. Uh, let me just say this. I don't believe that the president of the University of Missouri should have stepped down at all. You know, cowering in the face of bullies like the professor we heard there is ridiculous. The reporter saying, I have a right to be here. No, you don't. Yes, you do. It is public property, public domain. Let me explain to you the rules and the laws that apply. Public domain allows that reporter and that photographer to be there. If I learn nothing else from NBC News in my tenure there, I know where I can be legally. I know what the laws are. And I know it's something else. It's called the, the Constitution of the United States of America. It's called the freedom of speech, which clearly these liberals have no concern for. They don't care about your freedom of speech. They care only about their message. And if your message isn't in line with theirs, well, clearly they will attack you, run you. They will bully you into quitting, into walking away, into not doing your job. Stand up, America. Enough. It's the Steve Gerber Show. Genuine Michigan common sense on display every day. Someday they won't let you. Now you must agree. The times they are telling. I understand that today, the day before Veterans Day, which is tomorrow, make sure if you see any veterans tomorrow, you you reach your hand out, you tell them thank you. To the men and women that are veterans of this of this country, let me say. From all of us here at the Steve Gruber Show, thank you for all that you have done. Thank you. Also, I'm told that it is the 240th birthday of the Marine Corps today. The United States Marines established this day 240 years ago. Speaking of veterans that have been a lot of hairy places, there you have it. The United States Marines, if you're in the United States Marine, thank you for your service as well. Uh, we have uh, a hotline call. Walt is on the line from Kalamazoo today. Uh, Walt, welcome to the program. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot, Steve. Good talking to you. 
Uh, one of the things that I've been wanting to get to you about, and it's, uh, some of it is about today's topic, but the the one thing that really strikes me is I heard about the dissertation that uh, our president gave, and it was something to the effect of how to tear apart uh, a capitalist culture like ours, how to how to break it down to zero, and it seems to kind of be what his goal has been. So it was for his father too. But one of the things that he is starting to, well, that he's actually forgetting, is that if you look at the word state, like the state of Israel or the state of Michigan, a state is an individual sovereign country, and the United States are developed basically as several individual countries that have come together as one. And I think he is actually pushing it a little bit too far. And I think if all 50 states, or at least the majority of them, felt like they wanted to secede, I don't think there's much he could do about it. Well, I, I don't think it could happen, though, because the last time states seceded from the Union, in the spring of 1861, it didn't work out very well. No, it didn't, but I think a lot of them would be northern states this time. No, you, yeah, you, you may be correct about different. that, but uh, I think that... Um, you know, the only state that was legally allowed to secede from the Union was Texas. It's in their state constitution from 1845, if I, if memory serves. But many would even argue that Texas would not be allowed to secede from the Union uh, in this day and age. But I, I appreciate the call, Walt, and it's a good conversation to have. It is, and I appreciate uh, you bringing that to our attention. The hotline number is 888-900-9966. 888 900 And you talk about overreach of the government. Right, you, you talk about overreach of the government and all of the things that this government does, and not just this administration. This administration is taking it farther than any previously. But all of the things the government does that have absolutely nothing to do with the Constitution, whether it's health care, Social Security, whatever it may be, there's no authorization in the, you know, constitutionally speaking, for many of the government programs. Um, and earlier this year, let me give you another example. Earlier this year, the United States Department of Agriculture announced a $100 million plan grants, which is a cute word, which is just means that they're taking taxpayer dollars, giving them back and never expecting them to come back. Um, a hundred million dollars in grants offered through their biofuel infrastructure partnership program. According to secretary of agriculture, Tom Vilsack, a raging liberal, the move is to make renewable fuel options more available to American consumers. But the fact of the matter is ethanol has been an, an abject failure and is now almost universally accepted in some circles that biofuels such as ethanol are the answer to America's energy woes. But the problem is ethanol, wait for it, ethanol produces more greenhouse gas than fossil fuels. You know. If anybody bothered to do their homework once in a while, and, and there's several studies that show greenhouse gas production from ethanol far exceeds fossil fuels, the, the, the proof is, is well, it's, it's indisputable. Lloyd Benson, the fourth year from the National Center for Policy Analysis, the senior research fellow covering education reform, school choice, student engagement, energy, environment, natural resources, and economics. Welcome to the program, Lloyd. Thank you very much. Don't have a lot of time here, but uh, two hundred and ten million dollars for the taxpayers to build infrastructure for uh, for a fuel that uh, they say do not uh, certain fuels do not use in boats, gasoline powered equipment because it could cause damage and is prohibited by federal law. And again, you wonder why people are confused. Well, there's a big problem here. It's very sad. Um, these biofuels. The first one is ethanol. It's been around for thirty, forty years, and they think it's the cure for uh, mixing with, uh, you know, fuel today and making it more eco-friendly. And what they've done is mixed it for the E10, E15, E85, and it ended up being a disaster. And it's really costing us so much, not only uh, the farmers, in those states, but uh, like Iowa and uh, Nebraska, Minnesota, and such, but really costing the economy and 
taxpayers and uh, everyone's really suffering through all this. And it's not helping any. I mean, if, if your intention was to lower greenhouse gases, which apparently, you know, uh, global warming is more dangerous than the Soviet Union with nuclear missiles, apparently. Um, right. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. Uh, and if, you're, if your aim was to lower greenhouse gases, that was an abject failure as well. Yeah, so they really tried. President uh, George W. Bush uh, really believed this was something he could do. And uh, we're having to pay for it today. You see, I believe uh, that George W. Bush and, and Barack Obama saw it as a way to buy votes in places like Iowa. See, I, 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 I really be- was. I think it was a way to buy votes in the first state that votes, Iowa. And secure your nomination. That's what I think. I'll give you 10 seconds for the last word, Lloyd. Yes. Uh, candidates, even today, are going to Iowa and promising to continue with ethanol. And what I would say is uh, let's not do that anymore. Uh, let's be real with Iowans and the rest of the country and say it's time for us to get rid of this failed program. I appreciate it. Lloyd Benson from the National Center for Policy Analysis. Thank you so much. Thank you as well. All righty. It's the Steve Gruber Show. We'll be back in a moment. Getting your day started with news from around the state and around the world. Common Sense Radio. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Cue them up, boys and girls, because it's it's party time. It's debate night in America. Debate number four for the Republicans, and yeah, despite the um, the critics of Saturday Night Live, SNL posted its best numbers in four years, from what I'm reading. So Saturday Night Live, with their special guest host Donald Trump, uh, crushed it, uh, and I didn't think he was that great, but. Maybe our next guest got a few chuckles out of Rafi Williams, RNC spokesman here with us again. Rafi, welcome back. Thanks for having me on, Steve. How are you doing today? I'm good. What did you think about the Donald on uh, Saturday? You know, used to call me on your cell phone, get a little shuffle going on. I I got a good chuckle out of the shuffle. That was the only clip I saw, though. Uh, I didn't see the others. What was your favorite? I liked it when the, he had the the president of Mexico come in. Here's your check for the for the uh, for the wall. I thought that was <laughs> you know that. I mean that's good. That's good stuff. So all right, uh, a couple of folks won't be there tonight. And so what do we have? Nine contestants tonight. Eight, nine, whatever it is. Um, but Chris yep. Christie, who I thought had a pretty good debate last time around, and really you know you know we're sitting here talking about fantasy football. I thought it was one of the best comments from the previous debate. Uh, he's not on. Mike Huckabee's not on. Uh, which is predictable. I don't think Huckabee's uh, gotten any momentum uh, this cycle. Uh, I don't expect him to do much at all this time around, but uh, that leaves the main event with eight or nine players. What has to happen tonight in your estimation? So there are eight players in that main stage, and I think what you're going to see tonight is people actually talking about the economy. I mean, everybody wanted to talk about the economy last debate, but CNN, or CBC, sorry. And so tonight Fox Business has told us we're going to focus on the economy. We're going to bear down on it and figure out who has the plan to get America going again. Because at the end of the day, we're sitting at the lowest uh, labor force participation rate since Carter. And that's just completely unacceptable. And, and I know people in Michigan are experiencing they're feeling wage stagnation. They're struggling to find jobs to be able to change jobs if they need to. Uh, and Republicans have a lot of good ideas to get the company, country moving again. But we didn't get a chance to talk about it last time. But that's really what has to happen tonight. Well, no question. It's not just that. The fact is that... Uh, average family incomes have dropped five, six thousand dollars. Um, private home ownership has dropped dramatically in the last six and a half years. Uh, the debt of America, as everybody knows, has absolutely skyrocketed. So there are a lot of economic problems here, and we're headed for a complete disaster economically in this country. And it's it's predictable. It's right in front of everybody. So we need to have a conversation about economics. Yeah, I mean, I think the Democrats really are ignoring it. You know, Hillary Clinton giving Obama an A grade, Bernie Sanders saying, let's, let's get government more money, let's tax you more. I mean, they are going the wrong direction. And I think the person who's going to have a standout night tonight is the person who is most able, is most ably, I'm sorry, is most capable of explaining in simple terms their growth plan and why it will work in a convincing manner that doesn't allow the moderators or other debaters to push back on. I think what I need to see tonight is um, not just that. I need somebody to explain to me how 
how it's even possible to recover from 20 or $22 trillion in debt or whatever it will be when Obama finally, you know, stops splurging on things that we can't afford. When Obama starts stops wasting money, um, how much is that debt going to be? And is it past the point of no return or can it be reversed? If so, how? Uh, I mean, everybody wants to know. If so, how are we going to turn this debt around? Because... You know, the fact that most people can't do basic math, I understand, Rafi, but somebody has to be the adult in the room and turn this train around. Well, I, mean, I was watching Hillary Clinton last night in New Hampshire, uh, and she's talking about this new uh, higher ed spending she's going to do, and she says, don't worry, it'll all be paid for. So we went on her website, we took a look, and there's no definition of how she's going to pay for anything. She says, I'll close tax loopholes. Well, which ones? What are you going to actually do? Because so far, you proposed billions of extra spending on top of what we already can't afford. You're mortgaging our future even more. You know, now I'm hopeful that we can turn this around. I think we can. People I talk to say, you know, if we get things like a balanced budget going, uh, we get things that rein in our budget, rein in our spending, um, that, that'll help move the country back in the right direction where, uh, you know, we won't just be paying off interest. Um, but, you know, Hillary Clinton and the Democrats, they have, they have very little interest in figuring out how to do such a thing. Well, yeah, and, and here we are. So I guess uh, the other thing that I'm, that I'm going to be watching closely tonight for me, uh, Jeb Bush has um, got a lot of unfavorable comments recently, people saying things like his campaign is on life support. I guess we will find out if that's really true. But uh, uh, Jeb Bush and John Kasich, they better make themselves heard this time around. Uh, John Kasich, dangerously close to not qualifying next time around. Rand Paul, dangerously close to not qualifying next time around. And Jeb Bush, just dangerously close, becoming irrelevant in this cycle. My opinion. Yeah, I think that, you know, there are a lot of people on that stage who are, you know, right above the, the cutoff line. Uh, and whether that's in polling or whether that's in, you know, uh, momentum to the campaigns, and they will need a big night tonight. I think you listed them. Uh, and I think what will also be interesting is to watch, you know, the Cruz Rubio dynamic. I think it'll be interesting to see how Carson plays out after, you know, the media attacked him all last week and whether other candidates will jump on or whether Carson will be able to just explain things, uh, as he usually does. So I think that there's a lot of undercurrents here, uh, where every candidate has a little something to show and to prove. Um, and I think that, you know, we have to see how these people who just made the cut are going to perform. Are they going to come out swinging or are they going to stick to their guns? I guess my question also, because you bring something to mind as I'm sitting there listening to you talk about that a little bit. Um, a lot of folks believe that Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio put on the best performance during the last debate. I, I, I don't argue that point. I thought they both uh, were very strong in their responses and their answers. I, I think if you see Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio have another good night tonight, that those two will continue to garner support. And, and, and we're at the point where... Uh, money matters, of course. So when Huckabee falls behind or Christie falls behind, the money lags behind, too. We know that Rubio's had a, a good fundraising month. So has Ben Carson. Ted Cruz is still strong. The money begins to matter. And, of course, we go back to Jeb Bush, the $100 million man, whose supporters, you know, the you know billionaires are headed singer, headed over to Rubio's camp. So it becomes critical as to how you get your message out as well. So these debates do matter. I'll be watching Cruz and Rubio, though, closely as well. Yeah, I think you're right. I think they, um, you know, they are young, they are energetic, they're Hispanic, uh, and they're great faces for the Republican Party, no doubt about it, especially when you compare it to the faces of the field we have on the left. I think that the Republican depth and diversity is something we should be very proud of, um, especially because the Democrats try to be claim the mantle of the multicultural party. But you look at their presidential contenders, and it does not look that way. You know, it's interesting. Um, I want to stop you right there because you make a good point. Because I saw an article yesterday where they were going through um, uh, who would be the best running mates for Hillary. And, of course, they go to Health and Human Services uh, Secretary, the former mayor of San Antonio, because he's Hispanic. Think, well, that's going to be the thing that shows diversity. You know, We've got two guys at the top of the ticket, potentially, that could be, you know, uh, wooing the Hispanic vote. We've got an African-American. We have a woman. You know, uh, the Republicans have all of these folks in different faces, in different places. You know, it's interesting that the, the liberal writers, well, you know, if she just puts, you know, the uh, Hispanic as her running mate, then, well, that'll just show how diverse we are. I'm like, I'm sorry. What are you guys smoking? You know, yeah, it, it, it's outrageous to me. Three out of the four female governors in this country are Republicans. Um, the two Indian-American governors in this country are Republican. 
uh, the one Hispanic governor in this country is Hispanic. Or sorry, the one Hispanic governor in the country is Republican. Right. We, it, Republican Party has been a party where, you, based on your merits, you succeed or fail, and that has allowed anybody, no matter of your class, no matter of your race, your background, to succeed if you have the drive and will. I mean, and I think that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. Democrats are the ones who like to, you know, cherry pick. Oh, we got to get a black guy in this room. We got to, and that's what I think holds minorities back more than anything. Rafi Williams, always a pleasure on the Steve Gruber Show. with Michigan and the world. Hey, by the way, this part of the program brought to you by Total Firearms. Go see my friend Mark. Little Mark out there. Yeah, go see him. Uh, If you need uh, anything, um, TotalFirearmsGunShop.com. Anything you need out there, you're going to find it. TotalFirearmsGunShop.com. New, used, uh, good deals, antiques. I mean, uh, these guys put on the uh, gun and knife shows all over the state of Michigan on uh, almost uh, every weekend. You can find everything you need, no question. Now, we just had a caller call up and say, listen, we're falling into the same trap as the Democrats. I disagree. The point that I was making about Susana Martinez, Susana Martinez, the governor of New Mexico, or Nikki Haley, uh, the governor of South Carolina, and others in the Republican Party, is that the Republican Party truly is a party of opportunity and inclusion, you know, compare that to what you have on the other side. We actually encourage robust debate, the free exchange of ideas. We embrace this little thing we like to call the United States Constitution. It's a novel little piece of um, a little of, of writing from a couple of hundred years ago. You might want to read it, but uh, and the, the cause of a falling of the same trap, I don't believe that, and, and that's why. Um, here's something from the Washington Post, by the way. But I wanted to share with you today, and I have an opportunity here. There's something from the Washington Post I want to share because it's an op-ed piece from yesterday. That uh, The headline, Obama's olive branches are lifeline for authoritarian regimes. Uh, they say that he is enabling, financing, and promoting dictators. Dictators. At the heart of President Obama's foreign policy is the long bet that American engagement with previously shunned regimes will, over time, lead to their liberalization without the need for either a messy domestic revolution or a bloody U.S. use of force. By definition, however, it will be years before we know whether the policy works. It nevertheless is becoming clear that the regimes on which Obama has lavished attention have greeted his overtures with a counter-strategy. It's possible, they calculate, to use the economic benefits of better relations to entrench their authoritarian systems for the long term while screening out any liberalizing influence. Rather than being subverted by U.S. dollars, they're being saved by U.S. dollars. So far, the dictator's bet is paying off. The latest evidence of that came Sunday in Burma when the generals who still rule the country staged an election carefully structured to preserve their power The Constitution under which it was held bans opposition leaders from becoming president and reserves a quarter of the parliamentary seats for the military. Now, Obama might claim that the lifting of U.S. sanctions and the two trips he made to the country helped prompt this limited Democratic opening. The generals, well, they see it another way. The restricted system and the inflow of U.S. and European investment it enables make their political supremacy sustainable for the long term. As proof, they can point to the fact that they rebuffed U.S. appeals for constitutional reforms before the election with no consequence for the new economic relationship, none whatsoever. That Iran's supreme leader is pursuing a similar course became clear in recent days as the arrest of two businessmen with U.S. uh, citizenship or residency came to light. Having allowed reformist President Hassan Rouhani to negotiate the nuclear deal with Obama, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and the Revolutionary Guard intend to pocket the $100 billion or so in proceeds while forcibly preventing what they call the penetration of Western influence that Obama hopes for. I I guess it, well, it worked in the teacher's lounge when him and his friends talked about it over coffee. I mean, it worked there. Why wouldn't it work in the real world? Why can't we just hug and kiss and sing kumbaya? Because, Barry, it doesn't work that way. Wisen up. Back to the WAPO piece. 
Hence the taking of more U.S. hostages to the imprisonment of the post Jason Razan and two other Iranian Americans. Ad Nazar Zaka, a U.S. based internet specialist, and Siamak Namazi, an Iranian American who has publicly advocated for better relations between the countries. The lack of any U.S. response means that the open season on Americans will continue in Tehran. Khamenei, however, Khamenei, however you say, Khamenei, whatever you prefer, doesn't get the prize for the best jujitsu on Obama. Remember, this is a Washington Post piece. The far left Washington newspaper is saying this. They don't get the best prize for the best jujitsu on Obama. That goes to Raul Castro, the 84 year old ruler of a weak and impoverished Cuba, who has managed to transform the resumption of U.S. Cuban relations into an almost entirely one sided transaction, says the Washington Post. Since announcing the end of the 50 year freeze between the countries 11 months ago, Obama has twice loosened restrictions on U.S. travel and investment in Cuba. And thanks to that, tourism arrivals up 18% this year. Billions in fresh hard currency are flowing in. The White House has dispatched a stream of senior officials to Havana, including Commerce Secretary Penny Ritzker, the Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas, the last month paid, paid court to the general who heads Castro's repressive internal security apparatus. In response to this, Castro has done virtually nothing other than reopen the Cuban embassy in Washington and allow a cell phone roaming agreement. Castro, meanwhile, shunned U.S. offers from U.S. businesses and dramatically cut U.S. imports. Ritzker Pritzker did not sign a single deal during her high-profile visit last month. Not one single deal. Instead, Cuban officials are using the prospect of increased U.S. trade and investment as chum to strike bargains with other countries. According to a report by the U.S.-Cuba Trade and Economic Council, while imports of U.S. food are down 44% this year, imports from China have skyrocketed 76%. So the message is this. It's okay to capture U.S. dollars while excluding U.S. business and cracking down on anyone favoring liberalization. The dictators are winning. Barack Obama is losing. And the Washington Post just outlined it in black and white. His foreign policy is a disgrace, but it's going to get one step worse. I've told you this for a long time. I should repeat it now. Barack Obama will try to give Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, the entire base to Raul Castro as a wedding gift. Mark my words. He's going to try to put all those prisoners likely in Colorado, and then give Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, to the Castro brothers as a wedding gift. Yeah, there's something wrong with this administration.